I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. So today's event, Centering Social Justice and Community Engagement, is co-sponsored by Campus Compact, the National, Institute, the National Center for Institutional Diversity, and the Edward Ginsburg Center of Community Service and Learning at the University of Michigan. Uh, my name is Cecilia Morales, and I'm the Engaged Scholarship Manager of the Ginsburg Center and the co-editor of the Michigan Journal. As such, it's my honor to welcome you all to this critical conversation. So on your screen, there are some, communi some community guidelines for how we're inviting you to engage today. I've already mentioned that live captioning is available, so please utilize those as it's helpful for you. Your videos are off and your audio has been muted. I head to the breakout rooms for the second part of the event. We've pinned the featured speakers, um, but you may need to select speaker view in the upper left corner in order to focus on the correct people. You can also go into your video settings and select hide non-video participants to help you focus on the speakers. Uh, we invite you all to submit questions or comments via Zoom chat. We won't be inviting participants to speak until the breakout rooms. Finally, this session is being recorded and the video will be available on the NCID website um, following the event. I wanna start by providing a bit of context for our gathering and say a little bit more about how many remarkable and about how the many remarkable individuals you um, will be hearing from today came to initially. In 2019, the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Ginsburg Center made the decision to collaborate on a special issue on the topic of centering social justice in the scholarship of community engagement for the Michigan Journal. That issue was published online in open access last year. The special issue highlighted the opportunities and the challenges of higher education, civic and community engagement, and ways for scholars and practitioners to move towards more just and equitable community outcomes. Today's event is intended in part to celebrate that issue and to recognize the many authors, reviewers, and editors who contribute, contributed to its success. We're thrilled to be joined by authors from each of the six published manuscripts who will be speaking and responding to questions about their important research and breakout rooms in the second portion of this event. So I hope you will join a breakout room later to learn from these visionary scholars and the cutting edge work they're producing, as I know I've learned a lot from being part of the conversation with them over the last couple of years. For now, I'm pleased to introduce the two featured speakers who should be popping up on the screen with me um, for, the second, for the first part of our event. Um, tab, Dr. Chab, Tabby Chavez and Dr. Tania Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Chavez is the director of the National Center for Institutional Diversity and Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts at the University of Michigan. She's also a professor of education and psychology at the University of Michigan and has published extensively on diversity and multicultural climates in secondary and higher education settings and implications for students' academic, social, and psychological adjustment, among the other topics. Dr. Tinian Mitchell is an associate professor of higher education in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy, and Development at the University of Minnesota's College of Education and Human Development. She's an internationally recognized scholar in service learning and community engagement, and I'm pleased to say is also a member of the Michigan Journal's editorial board. Tabby and Tania also served as special guest editors for our Centering Social Justice issue and co-authored the, in the issue's introduction. Tabby and Tania, you both bring incredible experience as scholars and as academic leaders, and I wanna thank you for taking the time to share some of your wisdom with us today. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Great. Um, so to help us frame the conversation, I want to start with defining some central concepts. Um, so Tania, we'll start 
with you with this question. In your perspective, what are some of the key values and principles underlying a social justice approach to community engagement? And I'm using community engagement here to refer to a wide range of research methods, experiential learning, and other forms of campus community partnerships. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Cecilia, for that question, and thank you to um, the National Center for Institutional Diversity and, and uh, the Ginsburg Center and our other partners for hosting the event today. Um, so first of all, I think that it's important to reiterate how important we think it is that the work of community engagement centers social justice. And so when we start to think about what are those values and principles, I can point back to the article that I wrote for the Michigan Journal in 2008 on critical service learning and recognizing how some of the language has shifted, right, from service learning to community engagement um, to civic learning. There, there are many, um, many names for the work that we do in terms of our engagements with community. But uh, in thinking about what it means to bring a critical approach to, to service learning and community engagement, I was really emphasizing being explicit and unapologetic about our attention to social justice in this work. And so in that article, I highlight three key things that I think that we should do. And one of those is bringing attention to social change. The second is our work to redistribute power in those relationships, uh, the hierarchies that are consciously and unconsciously reinstituted through the work of community engagement, and then also to work towards developing authentic relationships. Um, I think Aurora Santiago Ortiz's work to push that conversation into a space of solidarity is really important in thinking about that as underlying principles. And then as we've been navigating the last three years um, with many of the incidents that we have seen with regard to extrajudicial judicial killing of Black um, men and women uh, with everything that we've been experiencing with the coronavirus um, pandemic and the disproportionate ways that we've seen um, the pandemic and access to vaccines and other aspects of the pandemic, like uh, really reinforcing uh, what is an inequality loop in our society, I think that it um, that that has brought me into thinking a little bit more about other opportunities we have through community engagement to truly bring a social justice approach. And I think that you know, as I think about the work of attention to social change that I introduced in critical service learning, I've been thinking more about what is our responsibility to reveal, like to truly lay bare, right, the systemic and structural. Um, injustice that many of our institutions have participated in, but that um, is undergirding many of the social concerns that we see in our society. I think it's also important for us to do work that is reparative, um, that we're really looking at and working with communities to understand what are the next best steps to promote their healing. And so how do we bring forward um, a more reparative approach to the ways that we do community work feels like an important value. And I think in, in thinking about how we get to repair, right, that um, those that important relationship um, with community members uh, and really thinking about our responsiveness to the concerns that they bring forward and the ways that we decide to engage with them in those works that move towards community liberation, right? Um, recognizing that the liberation of, of one can lead to the liberation of all. And so really thinking about the ways that we are, um, we are working in solidarity with others um, to bring forward the kinds of changes that community members are speaking that they need. Thank you for that. Um, Tabby, would you like to add anything to that? Well, what usually stated by Tania, um, I guess the one thing that I, I that's on my mind related to that is uh, given what has been happening over the last few years, the uh, opportunity to, you know, those who have been involved and have developed partnerships and experiences and ethical and rigorous approaches to community partnership, like using this moment where people are, some are newly aware <laughs> and um, of historical and contemporary uh, equality and are looking for opportunities to support and to you know bring change or to to uh, uh, also um, put their efforts to change is that you know it's really critical for uh, to honor the expertise 
<laughs> those who have been doing the work because, um, and take advantage of the fact that these are scholars and partners and community members who can actually show a path forward. If you actually are interested in making a difference here, four or, or eight or 12 ways that you can do so and to do so in a way that actually centers our experience um, and not your perceived you know, um, mode of, of the kind of help or support or, or um, solutions that we need. So I'm also just thinking a lot now around like using my own role in positionality and, and, and others who have been in this space. Um, how can we use our roles to bring resources to those who are newer to the table, but not in ways that recenter them over those who have been in the space and the communities who've been working in partnership with university partners for a long time. Thank you for that. Really recognizing the importance of honoring the work that's come um, and the expertise of the community as well. Uh, this next question is related probably um, to some of the things that, that Tania, you mentioned already. Um, but in your intro to the special issue, you stated that, quote, many higher education institutions are now grappling more deeply with how they have been and continue to be complicit in the colonialism and white supremacy that fuel oppressive structures. So at the same time that we see all this progress being made, we've often heard this critique that some diversity, equity, and inclusion and social justice initiatives in higher education are too quick to call for unity and to celebrate diversity without acknowledging present and historical harms that systematically disadvantage many individuals. So my question is, how can faculty and staff acknowledge this history, often that has harmed particular communities, to promote grounded understanding a space of healing within campus community partnerships? And Tabby, maybe you can start with that question. I'll, I'll jump in uh, to start. Uh, we have to be honest and own it. Um, we're at a a critical point in higher education history. I mean, I think there have been waves of history, so we're not in uh, the only point, but we're in a point that's characterized by particular forms of, of inequality or the racial awake, awake reckoning that was sparked in 2020, the divisiveness of the 2021 elections, um, the ongoing inequalities that were induced or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, come are coming together um, to create a set of conditions um, and, a, and a context um, that is increasing awareness around systemic, systemic inequality. Um, as scholars, we all need to be informed about our context, both current and historical, um, and also acknowledge that people who have come before us, including scholars and community partnerships um, that are collaborating at the local or national level, um, that they have come before us and that it's sometimes that our institutions and scholars um, and members of our institutions have not gotten it right. <laughs> um, we have caused harm or been um, passive in the context of harms um, um, to communities that need to be repaired. Um, and so when, when thinking about you know, engaging in community-based work and all the name and all the ways that you described Cecilia and Tania in, in, the, in the first question, it goes beyond the individual. So it's not about what you have done or not done um, that I, as a scholar um, who works in, in engagement and partnership with a variety of school and community spaces, must understand that when I'm entering a community setting, um, I am experienced as an institutional actor. <laughs> so even if I view myself as an insider, you know, in some ways sharing an identity with the group, I have entered settings where, you know, with uh, African-American communities and spaces where I, it's me, my Black co-PIs, co my Black students and staff who are working with me. And the response initially is at least, is that you're, you're from that University of Michigan. <laughs> That's who you are. Um, so you're white. <laughs> and, um, and, to, and, and I have to, and instead of being defensive, <laughs> like, you know, one is before you enter the space, you should kind of know what's happened in the space before you to own that as a part of like your responsibility to the space that you may think you share an identity, but you are not an insider in, 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 in lots of ways too. Um, and you are also responsible for working in ways that counter those past approaches as unfair as that is. Um, it, you, you didn't do it, but you are a part of the institution um, and, and also engaging with them in ways that what, in articulating what would it look like to you to not work in the same way and what approaches you know, would be required, you know, and would be required from me in order for you to trust and understand that. 
Um, and I'm responsible for influencing the other people that I work with, the students I mentor and train, the staff and faculty colleagues I work with to enter spaces with a similarly Appro similar approach of integrity and respect for who you're engaging with. Um, this history and acknowledgement must be included in our curriculum and norms for training and development of student, staff, faculty engaged in this work, whether it's community-based service learning or community-based engaged scholarship. Um, and I will just note that it's uniquely tough right now. I think we always are saying we're in a unique time, but this feels really interesting, and at least in my lifetime. Um, we're in a space where Due to the events of the past few years, historical harm um, acknowledgement is being actively, aggressively challenged and silenced. Um, you know, ironically, the events of the past few years have increased awareness and acknowledgement of historical and current social inequality among many. But at the same time, <laughs> there's there equally fervent effort to deny history and push back against teaching and learning around historical inequality as evidenced by the current ways of anti quote, quote unquote critical race theory and divisive concepts legislation focused on race and sexual orientation. Um, so there's a challenge even more to like actually engage in this very necessary historical context and acknowledgement work um, that we're gonna have to push against and recognize as a form of resistance you know, in our own work and in how we engage and support partners. Um, Despite this, <laughs> um, community engagement in higher education that reflects rigor and integrity uh, requires us to acknowledge and challenge academic cultures and practices that to account for past harm with legacies that continue now. There are power dynamics that have hindered our community partnerships, including partnership goals um, and priorities and how they're established, how resources are allocated, how impact and outcomes of a partnership are evaluated and assessed often without the input <laughs> and um, the uh, centering of the community themselves, you know, to claim we've made impact in a community without any kind of metric that relates to what the community actually views as impactful is unfortunately not common at all. Um, a cultural example is, you know, because I have the grant, I have the expertise and the funding, and so that gives me the right to bring that into a space and to kind of set the conditions of in a very hierarchical way not acknowledging that you're getting critical expertise and gifts from a community that's agreeing to engage with you around your work. You know, um, again, just for, for certain types of research. Base. A structural example is how research grants, um, internal or external to a university, may have expense categories that prohibit compensating community partners <laughs> in ways that are easy to compensate with university-based units and individuals. Um, our community partners are no less expert Yet policies like that, you know, systematically signal that only certain entities are valid sources of experts and expertise and skill. So we must evaluate these types of practices, both cultural and structural, and advocate for changes in the spaces we control and influence. And in doing so, reimagine centering the voices of our communities in all in all of our work. Thank you so I much for that. <laughs> And thank you for speaking both to the, the structural and the cultural, right? How, how we as individuals can impact these systems and also how um, the structures themselves need to be reevaluated. Um, Tania, would you like to add to that comment? I don't think there's much to say. <laughs> you know, Tabby really did such an incredible job of, of introducing Introducing and reiterating, like what what are those barriers and what are our opportunities for intention? You know, I think um, just one. You know, Tabby spoke spoke really eloquently to the gifts that community um, offers to us when we're um, given permission, right, to um, to really participate and engage in community spaces. And I think that finding the ways to honor um, to you know, there's one piece like of repaying the gift, right? And 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 showing our generosity, showing our generosity back to the communities. Um, but I also think that there are ways that we need to honor the knowledge, the experiences, and the history um, of those community members. And uh, finding those elders, building relationships with them, um, collecting their stories, sharing their stories, uh, I think is another really important part of the work that we should do and can do because you know as Tabby was saying like you walk into a space you are the institution regardless of 
all of the other identities you may bring with you. If you've lived in that community for 20 years, um, people will still see you as the university or in, in, insert name of your institutional agent here, right? Um, and and so, so even as we think we understand those histories, we don't know, we may not know fully the impacts on, on the people. And so our efforts to collect those stories and to make sure that they are heard and known and circulated amongst institutions so that people don't go in naively thinking, you know, I could, I can, I can make change happen in space, right? We've, we've talked for a long time about all of the ways that we need to mind people of the many, many, many times people have come in from the institution and, and purported to make some kind of change or some kind of difference in space only to write the report that's ended up on health for the next person to write their next bigger grant. Right, um, and and that there's legacies of harm, um, there's legacy disruption that get instituted in our communities because we wanted to operate that way. And so, figuring out how we collect and share those narratives so that we can prevent ourselves from from repeating those same harms, I think, is another important piece of our work to acknowledge history. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to sh shift the conversation a little bit by saying that. The the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Ginsburg Center at the University of Michigan came together to publish this special issue, um, both to provide ongoing support for community-centered scholars and practitioners, and also to uplift right um, research methods and research that centers uh, social justice in this work. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about what individual scholars and practitioners can do. I'd like to think now um, and dig in more to the institutional policy piece um, and think about what institutional commitment and support is important to sustain and advance community engagement. Um, so we've talked a lot about the overlap in the missions between NCID and the Ginsburg Center. Um, can you both talk more about how to bring together campus DEI and anti-racism efforts and how can or should those efforts go hand in hand or bring bring um, DEI together with community engagement? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we're seeing in a number of places uh, the, the the chief diversity officer and the chief public engagement or, or community engagement officer in, at institutions are sort of, are kind of merging in some spaces. So I know, for example, the University of Texas um, has their, their chief diversity officer is also the, their chief community engagement officer. And so we're seeing some institutions that recognize um, the, the linkages and intersections of those spaces. And I hope that they are not being used, and I'm not talking about the University of Texas here, but I hope that they're not being used to, uh, to, uh, to divert resources <laughs> um, and not fully fund either of those directions. But you know, we, um, those are also possibilities, right? Um, but it, you know, I, I think that it is impossible for us to do community engaged work without also doing the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if we are trying to do those two projects as different things, then we're doing one or both of them wrong, right? Um, we, we definitely, we know that um, there is a lot of equity work that needs to happen on our campuses, um, but we also can't operate can't operate as if our campuses are siloed from the communities where we exist. And so the project of equity and inclusion is a project of both the university and the university's work in community. And so it feels really imperative for me that, that, that those efforts be hand in hand. Um, I think some of the things that we know in terms of what's happening on our campuses is that as we're doing the work um, to try to bring in, to diversify our faculty. To con this is like an ongoing project, this work to diversify the faculty. But, um, but as we're, you know, I, I, on my own institution, I've seen like a re, a, a re-energized um, effort of, in diversifying the institution, but we're hearing time and time again from new faculty who are coming to our campuses that um, the strategy of community engagement, of community-based research, of working in and with communities as part of their scholarship is 
a way that was important to their training and also important to their commitments to the ways that they want to be a part of the university. And so it's imperative that we make space and opportunity for those faculty that we start to rethink and reimagine what are the expectations of scholarly production so that the different ways and the longer and more time intensive ways that community engaged work needs to happen can also um, be supported in the timelines of those new faculty to promotion and tenure so that they are not unfairly punished or um, or uh, that their work gets less recognition or acceptance um, because it is either centered in community or um, not uh, not accepted in the top tier journals with all of the requirements um, that are that surround that whole process and the hierarchies there or um, you know or or fail to take into consideration like the importance of things like collaborative co-authorship um, or, or dissemination in multiple venues that will be acceptable and seen by all members of a constituency who might be, uh, who might benefit from this new knowledge and scholarly production that all of those things, all of those opportunities need to be rebuilt into the ways that we think about uh, scholarly production in terms to really support these new scholars um, with regard to their connections between diversity and equity and community engagement. Oh, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I'm soaking it in, wholeheartedly agreeing. And really, you know, you think me, you know, kind of what I'm thinking about is, uh, I mean, full agreement that you know we can't do the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion without an anti-racism lens. If we're not anti-racist in that in the work we're not doing DEI work um, even though DEI includes a range of interconnected um, and you know distinct and interconnected kinds of identities and spaces um, you know Tania's comment maybe you know, you know, made me you know, kind of really emphasize that when we think about uh, the kind of new new or renewed public engagement agendas of many institutions of higher education and a, either a new commitment or a recommitment um, that faculty of color you know or, and and those who are from historically minoritized or marginalized communities are often the ones who are leading the way <laughs> in how they have explored and established rigorous and effective practices characterized by you know, mutual benefit and integrity around community engaged research and service learning, teaching and pedagogy. Um, they're doing work that is extensively in the space of the kind of repairing and healing that we talked about. Um, and also offering campus communities with innovations related to com community based methods and strategies and really you know in thinking about kind of the pathway and the evaluation implications for promotion and tenure like really framing this work you know sometimes at some institutions even including in spaces within my own that the work is you know kind of locked into the bucket of service in a way that's like very anti intellectual because service is great um, but that really, um, there's a need to conceptualize this work as, you know, intellectually innovative and rigorous in ways that um, would warrant, you know, that understanding of the uniqueness of methods and the time needed for methodology that Tania mentioned. Um, you know, this relates to some of the work that we've been trying to do here um, in, 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 um, in our College of Literature, Science and Arts in Michigan. Um, the idea that recruiting these faculty is important and that we can actually like we're, we purport we purport to be smart in higher education so that we actually understand how to develop metrics and uh, approaches and criteria that relate to these types of contributions and to build them into um, our faculty evaluation um, criteria when we're hiring. Um, that's something that we've been working on here um, where our faculty recruitment efforts have included um, a definition of diversity, equity, inclusion commitments in the area of community engagement that defines it as intellectually based skills and competencies and experiences that people bring to theory and methodology, as well as to their teaching and pedagogy and or their service and engagement. And we provide our departments with a framework and tools and rubrics to actually understand how to actually look for that and evaluate the quality of that in faculty applications. That means that we are offering candidates, faculty candidates, the opportunity to write 
about work that sometimes there's not a space for and is invisible in the faculty application process. Um, and we prepare a search committee to evaluate it. Um, and we also must acknowledge and elevate the work of community engaged faculty. Um, I have been underwhelmed, you know, in, 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 at times where I have seen uh, public engagement awards and accolades go to scholars who only do one form of public engagement, the person who testifies before Congress, who is, which is a great type of public engagement, but, you know, the people who are selected are disproportionately not from minoritized communities. And that is viewed as a, a prestigious form of community engagement, whereas people who are doing highly contextualized, localized community work, the prestige is not attached in the same way. And so we need to be thoughtful about the ways that our norms and structures actually recognize and reward multiple profiles of a prestigious faculty member. Um, as an example, in Michigan, uh, in our NCID, in our center, we recently named five scholars as the inaugural cohort of research and community impact fellows, a campus-wide award and, and honor. Um, and we really framed the award and the engagement around it as highly as one of, of high prestige. This is the kind of work that we need to be recognizing, not just because it's the morally good work to do. Um, you know, moral good is not bad, but that is actually like pushing us forward in trying to make impact as a public institution. Um, and the innovations of theory and knowledge production that's co-constructed with the community bring something that's distinct from other forms of engaged work. Um, so by diversifying faculty who bring that kind of expertise, we also are offering these opportunities for our students <laughs> um, and models for our students who can engage in, these, in this kind of research production as well, um, and classroom experiences that are relevant to students' communities. Um, I will say that signaling that the institution values and respects students' communities and providing these students with opportunities to engage with, study, and contribute to their own communities through their university roles as students could be a powerful form of recruitment of students that we are overlooking, um, particularly those from historically underserved and underrepresented community backgrounds. So to give a little bit of a preview there, you know, two of the articles from our, the, 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 uh, the um, GACLS special issue um, took up the specific ways that potential opportunities and pitfalls related to um, the experiences of Asian American and Latinx students um, and how these kinds of service learning spaces and engaged spaces can serve as really important areas of identity development, or we can like overlook opportunities to use them that way if we're not thoughtful about our pedagogy. So just giving people a little bit of a heads up for the exciting breakouts that are coming. Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up too, um, because I think that, you know, creating all of these different spaces in classrooms, right? It, it, it's really important that everyone, that everyone hear and recall that, um, you know, community engaged spaces are spaces where your minoritized students on campus want to be, right? Um, the National Survey for, um, the National Survey for Student Engagement has shown us for the last, I think it's eight years consecutively, that minoritized students participate in community engagement um, rates um, as at higher rates than white students on their campuses, right? Their proportional engagement in this work is powerful and it is important to them. And so the more spaces that we create for their engagement, the better that we are doing and meeting a number of university metrics in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion with, it, with regard to our students. But I also think it's important for us to, to think about the community and the spaces and the ways that, um, the ways that our institutions sometimes hinder the possibilities for our engagement and community. Um, you know, Tabby spoke very thoughtfully about the restrictions on grants in terms of the ways that we can pay community partners. That extends into um, our everyday community engagement practices, right? It's not just grants that pr prohibit us from, um, from compensating community partners for their engagement. Sometimes it's our very own institutions who, because this work often gets couched as as service um, and and uh, isn't seen as the kind of intellectual enterprise that it it truly is um, that everyone should be volunteering in this space and so that includes community members who are often giving us the so many uh, so much of their time, energy, and expertise and knowledge to creating these spaces of learning um, or these these research opportunities for our institutions. 
Um, but we also have fallen into a trap around risk management and um, you know uh, issues of, of safety um, that often get misappropriated in terms of uh, creating unsafe spaces for some of our students on campus, but that uh, particularly those who are queer or, or who are gender nonconforming, uh, who find that the spaces that the university approves for community engagement are ones that end up being very unsafe spaces for them. So thinking about those issues as well as issues of access in terms of making sure that we're partnering with agencies and organizations that actually have the ability to receive students regardless of their mobility, um, impairments or other or other disabilities they may be experiencing. But it, it's also really um, one of the other things that have, 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 has happened around the risk management question is that we've been challenged or dictated to only work with officially recognized 501c3 organizations. And so sometimes that doesn't give us the opportunity to really engage in the most emergent and urgent issues that are happening in our community. Um, many people, I'm sure, on this, on this webinar at this point, um, I think there's like 270 people in here right now. But um, you know, a number, a, a number of people may or may not know. I live three blocks from where George Floyd was killed. Right, um, that space has become a really important, it's now called George Floyd Square, it's become a really important organizing space in the city of Minneapolis to respond to issues of police violence, but also to um, issues uh, that are best responded to through mutual aid, of addressing concerns around homelessness, of addressing concerns about violence in our community, of addressing concerns around food insecurity, um, and, and and other other things that are that are emergent in our in our cities, but there's no official 501c3 agency or organization that is at George Floyd Square. These are my neighbors and other members of the community who've gotten together under a moment of crisis and organized in ways that are responding to the immediate needs in my neighborhood, right? Um, there, the, the structures that we have put in place for what it means to be involved or engaged in a community may not always facilitate a connection to those kinds of spaces. And I think that we need to give, in order to truly have community engagement thrive on our, in our institutions um, and in our communities, we need to give people the opportunity to engage in the spaces that are most urgent and most necessary, um, regardless of the, the kinds of recognition that they have um, by cities, communities, or federal agencies um, as official nonprofits. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I wanna pick up on a thread that you had mentioned and there's this great question in the chat. Um, I wonder how you grapple with harmful practices and legacies that can live inside communities or institutions we partner with like schools. So recognizing that um, there is this tension between not wanting to imagine harms or potential dangers that don't exist, but also recognizing um, how we need to prepare students rec and, and particularly the students of color who um, are driving this work um, in those spaces. Um, Tabby, I wonder if you wanna um, respond to that question in the chat. Let me think of a number of examples <laughs> um, to go with. I mean, I think that using your role and your position Personality, um, you know, and I was just say I have, you know, in the as a member of the University of Michigan, that you know, I, I do know that in some of our local and uh, even non-local kind of school spaces that we work with, that that role goes a long way, um, and how to use it productively. I will I'll throw an example out, like one of my unfavorite ones, um, as I was working with a school district that had suddenly become. Um, single digit you know, African-American students to about 20% because of school closures and kind of the economic crisis that hit Michigan that it impacted um, schools and families. Um, and I was working with the, you know, with, with teachers and we were doing a project for related to black families and, their, and how they socialize their children around race um, and how, how community socialization also can support um, 
the you know, motivation and thriving of, of Black youth. Um, and the teachers in the school were you know, just concerned with what to do with that diversity. <laughs> like, what do we do uh, to all of these children who are coming from X, you know, insert the you know, metropolitan city that you might be thinking of, um, or, or when, um, do we teach them like the other children? You know, and I was like, they were human children the last time I checked. Um, and this was like, literally, this was during discourse where we, everyone was embracing how post-racial we are as America, you know, because we had just elected Barack Obama. And this was literally the day after Barack Obama was elected <laughs> that this conversation kind of occurred. Um, and I was like, oh, there goes your post-racial. Um, the approach really, I mean, and that reflected like, they were actually, this school was actually making attributions about poor performance that were attributing it to the to the poor children who were coming from the urban district, when in fact those children were overperforming compared to the black suburban children who were in the community who were having negative microaggressive climate experiences and the like too. So we actually use the data, <laughs> I mean, and our roles and like the idea that of course you wanna be decision and data driven in your approaches, right? Um, um, to like dispel them of that mythology that these children were coming in and kind of messing up your kind of grades and the like too. And we talked about like inclusive pedagogical practice and um, again, we were working with the schools for a few years <laughs> so that did not happen on day one, but we, you know, we approached them as if we assumed that they all cared about the success of children. And we, but we also like actively found strategic points to dispel myths and to like disabuse attribute of incorrect attributions that were being made. We brought parent data to the school. We also did work with, with uh, schools, with school personnel to get kind of their perceptions and try to match them against the data about what we do know about the high motivation of black families to, for their children to have school success. Um, so I would say that was an example where we were using kind of partnership openness, but like going in very aggressively to um, when we saw those spaces where those attributions and biases were happening or being made, um, you know, as one form. And again, that we were gonna be here for a while with you. <laughs> um, and that we, we also are speaking for families, um, you know, who are also holding us accountable for the messaging that we give to you too. And we also offered both the school and family resor families resources. So the families wanted like school and college workshops. And so we were like, we will give you whatever you want. We will bring that and schools wanted some professional development um, around these areas and issues, and so we offered it, you know, and you know, and, and provided it free, <laughs> you know, um, in ways that, you know, also then said if we're going to provide this, then we're going to come back and see how you're integrating it and, and adapting it as well. So, um, I think partnering and that kind of thinking about multiple forms of push and countering bias and resistance matter. Um, you know, I'll stop there because I, you know, I want to give Tania a little bit of time to. Uh, think of her most favorite and unfavorite examples as well. Oh my, my most favorite, no. Um, you know, I, I'm really just thinking about, about the opportunities that we have um, to use our, to use our time in community to give organizations that, that do hold some of these legacies of harmful practices um, and, give them some opportunity and space to really think about what what harms they've done um, or what what um, harms they perpetuate. And so the one example that I'm thinking about is um, was with an after school program where the students came back into the classroom, our college students came back into the classroom talking about the multiple times that they were hearing from the young students that they were working with about ways that they were called names or otherwise disparaged by people who were supposed to be, you know, mentors and staff leaders of the organization. And so um, the, the students decided to work together with their young people um, that they were partnered with in this organization and really to, um, to do some journaling and some reflective writing and write letters um, that they turned over to 
the board of directors for that agency. So they were given, so the board was then given an opportunity to really hear from the mouths of these young people, like what they were experiencing on the day to day. So that they could think about what are the interventions that they need to make as a board to disrupt or interrupt some of the things that are being perpetuated in, in those spaces. And so, so I think it, it's also about us paying really close attention to what we're hearing. Um, I'm trying to remember who who wrote about this, but I, I have, um, I, I'm remembering this experience of reading about an experience um, of, of, a, of, of a volunteer coordinator um, who was working with a, a population who was uh, either permanently or, or, or temporarily unhoused and was training volunteers to, to do that engagement and asked people like, what do you think, what do you think is, um, is why, why, we have, why we have homeless people? In, in our in our community and was eliciting answers and the staff member wasn't getting the answer that they wanted to and so the way that it was described in this text was that they they sort of like tipped their head back like they were taking a drink of something wanting to prompt students to to um to to say that you know that these people were alcoholics or or drunk or or otherwise um and the the thing that the that the person who was writing, I think it might have been Anne Marie Vaccaro, but anyway, my apologies if I'm if I'm now citing the wrong person. But uh, the what I remember about about this work and this intervention was was the real um concern that we that the the author had that if they somehow interrupted or disrupted this particular moment that the whole enterprise of community engagement was going to fall apart, right? If we challenge our partners um, for bad behavior, which is not the language that that was used in this piece that I'm remembering, but that if we challenge our partners for bad behavior, that somehow that is going to um, completely end relationships and opportunities that we have to work around these issues. And I think it's so important for us to remember two things. One, there are enough social and community concerns to go around that losing one partner is not going to end the work that we're doing. Um, and second, again, if we're prioritizing um, centering social justice and community engagement, that kind of risk taking is absolutely necessary. It is absolutely necessary because just as important as it is for us to be out there, it is important for us to hold ourselves and the people that we're working with accountable to also doing their best to bring forward a more just reality and future for the people that we're partnering with. Thank you. 